There's a legendary story that, uh, about uh, Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte and a Catholic cardinal, the Cardinal of France, during those days. And the story begins long before Napoleon and this cardinal met. If Napoleon uh, took power in France just at the end of the French Revolution. And the French Revolution, uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, was uh, devastating to the Catholic Church in France. Uh, the Catholic Church, all of the parishes were nationalized and uh, stripped from the church. Uh, priests were forced to take oaths of loyalty and oaths against many aspects of our Catholic faith, and if they did not, they were beheaded. Uh, in many parts of France, it was illegal uh, during that time to practice the Catholic faith. So when Napoleon came into power, uh, the church was actually very hopeful. Maybe we can get back to the way things used to be. And the people of God in France really wanted that. But Napoleon, it turns out, was really no friend uh, to the Catholic Church. At that particular time, he found it polit politically expedient to form a concordat with the Cardinal and with Rome. And so after that agreement between the Cardinal uh, and Napoleon had been signed and sealed, the Cardinal was on his way out, and Napoleon, uh, according to the legend, called after the Cardinal, and he said, Your Eminence, I want you to know one thing. I will destroy the Catholic Church. And the Cardinal stopped. <coughs> Excuse me, and he thought for a moment. And he said, Your eminent er, Emperor, with all due respect, what 1,800 years of priests has not been able to do, you are not going to be able to accomplish. And it's funny because it's true. It's funny because it's true. What 1,800 years or 2,000 years of priests haven't been able to manage, no one person can do. And I say that because we all know priests were not perfect. In fact, all of us priests find out how imperfect we are uh, after ordination and how amazing and inspiring it is to work with you, the laity, and how much you do inspire us. And so I preface, or I use that as a preface, to share with you a story about a priest friend of mine who some time ago, not a priest from this diocese, had had an inappropriate relationship with a consenting adult. And he was in this relationship with her, or they were in this relationship together, for some months. And no one knew about it, but, <coughs> I apologize, no one knew about it. But both of them began to feel kind of what comes with living a double life, like a schizophrenic kind of feeling. And so finally, the priest decided he was going to talk to the diocese about it. And he did. He told his bishop. And his bishop uh, asked him to take a leave of absence uh, from his parish that he had just arrived at only months prior. <coughs> and so he took those, uh, a, a month off to just pray and to discern and to think about it. what does he want and what is God calling him to do. And at the end of that month, he had arrived at kind of two conclusions. One, that he really did feel called to public ministry as a priest. But at the same time, he dreaded walking back into his parish, this parish that had just accepted him uh, as their pastor, and so wonderfully so. He did not look forward to that moment. In fact, he was so fearful of that moment, it was that thought that was really leading him down the path of not returning to public ministry as a priest. And by God's grace, in, in some good counsel, uh, he did. He did come back. And that dreaded moment, he told me, of when he first stepped into the back of his church, vested to celebrate Mass. He thought and feared you know, that moment that people would yell at him and curse him and 
not accept him back. But not only did they accept him back, at that moment, as soon as he stepped foot into the church, they gave him a standing ovation. They gave him a standing ovation of welcome, of acceptance, of forgiveness. And he told me sometime later that that moment was the single greatest moment of grace in his life. It was the single greatest moment of God's grace in his life. It wasn't his greatest moment, but it was the single greatest moment of God's grace and God's expression of grace in his life. But that moment of great grace, that moment of the greatest grace, was only possible because there had been that moment of the greatest fall from grace. And that is oftentimes how it happens. The greatest moments of grace are only because there has been a great fall from grace. And that is our Christian story. That is our Christian heritage. That is our Christian life. The greatest moment of grace in history, in all of history, was when our dear Lord came and took on human flesh. As the Philippians hymn says, He took on flesh and took the form of a slave being born into poverty and knowing human weakness, knowing human trial, knowing a fallen and broken spirit, going on to preaching and teaching in our midst and calling us to perfection and assuring us that it is possible only to then be falsely accused, beaten, mounting a cross, crucified and left for dead, and raised on that third day. And the greatest moment of grace happened and continued to burst forth both in the past and in the history yet to come. And the only reason that moment occurred and continues to occur and occurs at this Mass and will occur at the next Mass and occurred at last week's Mass. The only reason for the greatest moment of grace in all of history is because there was that prior event in history where there was the greatest fall from grace. The story of Adam and Eve, our parents, our first reading today. When they, thousands of years ago, because of their humanity, rebelled the first time against God and were disobedient to God and fell from communion with God and infected all of us with that same sin, that original sin, that inclination to rebel, that inclination to disobey, that inclination to think ourselves as God rather than servants and sons and daughters of God. Had it not been for the greatest fall from grace in the history of the world, we would not have known today the greatest moment of grace in the history of the world, Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking right now of that great line in the Exultet, which is proclaimed every year at the Easter Vigil, an ancient hymn and chant that is proclaimed in all the Catholic churches throughout the world on that night before Easter, where we hear, O happy fault, O necessary sin of Adam, that won for us so great, so glorious a Savior. Guys, as we go throughout our week this week, as we look back on our life, as we go through 
and forward and march into the history of our life. No matter the falls, no matter the failures, they can lead to once again those greatest moments of grace, God's grace. Not our greatest moments, but the greatest expressions of God's grace and presence and mercy in our life. This is why he came. So that our life might be patterned off of that. Our broken lives, our sinful lives, might come to know the great grace of God's redemption and mercy.